Hi friends, it's time for uh, Pastor's Questions. I'm Pastor Eric here at Pilgrim. And if you haven't yet seen yesterday's uh, sermon, I'd pull it up and uh, watch our worship service and uh, catch the passage, 2 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, Make sure you give that enough time. Uh, It is different than common uh, modern histories and, uh, and tackle these questions as well. If you're part of that Monday Night Pilgrim group that uh, goes through these questions, hello everybody, and I hope this helps you. First, first, I'm going to ask what's the big idea I mentioned early on. I referred to a big idea, but you have to listen for what I'm saying about it. And um, um, uh, remember it this way, Israel's call was to be a light to the nations. In other words, it wasn't just enough for them to settle in Uh, grow their own crops, um, have lots of children, and then have lots of grandchildren and everything will be okay. That's not the idea. That's not why God calls them and sets them apart. Through them, the Lord God is is going to save the world, and that's how we get directly to Jesus Christ. But I I want you to know that it's important for you to see how that worked itself out in this otherwise gory history. So take a minute on number, number one. Think about the big idea mentioned early on, how Israel was called as a light to the nations and how that makes sense of the passage uh, to some degree. Two, what are some of the weaknesses of words like reconciliation? I brought that up uh, throughout. When it comes to discussions between our neighbors, especially people of color and people who are white, what does it mean, Uh, especially for people of color to hear uh, that we're inviting them to be reconciled to us uh, or people who uh, who are white, majority culture? John Perkins, we know, is known for uh, moving away from using reconciliation as a useful term and for good reasons. But what do you think? What are some of the weaknesses in words like reconciliation? Three, when is the last time you prayed before saying something serious? Prayed before acting. Prayed before deciding something. Well, we hear sometimes that, uh, that, that politicians do this. Um, it often comes across as really tacky uh, and even suspicious when they talk about praying before making a decision. But here, David is described as doing just that. What about you? Four, let's say you lived in ancient Jabesh Gilead. How would you feel if you heard that a king from far away asked to rule over you. Do we know how Jabesh Gilead responded? And then how is David's letter an excellent example of tact and winsomeness, no matter how it was read by the target audience? This is about the residents of Jabesh Gilead in verses 4 through 7. Five, when's the last time you saw a public figure perform an act of kindness without trying to get credit for it? You heard something about the the president of Portugal saving someone who was drowning off the coast of Portugal uh, this summer, uh, but then it got on the news, and so he kind of did get credit for it. But when is the last time you saw a public figure perform an act of kindness without trying to get credit for it? And I'm thinking here of the warriors of Jabesh Gilead who marched over to Beit Shan to take Saul's body off the wall where it was being shown in order to give it a proper burial. Why is it hard for us to see kindness and faithfulness to others in public life? Remember, they didn't do this for public acknowledgement. They didn't even really know that David would know about it. But David found out about it and he thanked them for it, and rightly so. It was an honorable act and it showed where their loyalties lied. Okay, question six. Why all the blood and guts? And we're going to get more blood and more guts throughout this chapter and then through other narratives in the scriptures are are quite bloody, uh, um, almost almost, uh, rated not for children at all. Why the gore? Is the Bible trying to capture eyeballs or in the world of ancient scripture ears? Is the Bible making light of the gore? Is the Bible asking us to follow the example of the warriors? Hey, next time someone's chasing you, just stop and ram your spear through their stomach. What's admirable at the way the Bible describes the early stages of what's been called David's civil war? What's admirable about the way it's described? Because there's a very important factor there. And you want to see that and you want to understand it. And that's the context in which we hear and see 
all the, the blood and guts. Number seven, I called for three L's in our sermon. Lament, not directly. We covered that last week, and we'll hear more of it in 2 Samuel 3. Listen, and then also learn. These are good start to responding to racial injustice. But what might follow such steps for a majority white church such as Pilgrim? Let's just see that, say that we get those done in a, in, a, in a process over time. And then what? What's next? Number eight. Someone once said it's hard to hate someone you're praying for. So whom are you praying for this week that's different than you? A different background, different ethnicity, different views of God. And why is it urgent to pray for people who are different than us? And I don't mean someone you've never met, uh, living far, far away. I mean the neighbors right nearby, the ones that, that you know are distressed because they told you so. How are you praying for them this week? I urge you to do so. Um, it's hard to hate someone you're praying for. In fact, as we pray for them, the Lord gives us new and powerful love for them and for their good. Okay, that's all for this week. Uh, thanks for your time and attention. We'll see you soon.